Last time we saw how complex numbers can be interpreted as points in a plane. And that gave us two ways of representing a complex number. Uh, using the xy coordinates at the point, you can express the complex number in this rectangular form. And using the polar coordinates of the point, you can express the complex number using this polar or complex exponential form. As a quick side note, some people will drop the e, the complex exponential, in the polar form, and they will just write the complex number as r, and then they'll have angle theta. In this video, we're going to discuss how to do some of the basic arithmetic operations with complex numbers, and we're going to go ahead and start with addition and subtraction. When your complex numbers are in rectangular form, you're going to add or subtract them by simply adding or subtracting the real and imaginary parts separately. So what I mean by that, it's pretty simple. I'll just uh, give some examples. So let's say we have a complex number Z1. Let's do negative 3 plus j times 5. And let's do z2, which is 4 minus j. If we add z1 and z2, we're going to add the real parts and we're going to add the imaginary parts. So adding the real parts, negative 3 plus 4 gives you 1. And then separately, adding the imaginary parts, we have plus 5 minus 1 gives you positive 4. So that's going to give you z1 plus z2. And similarly, if we want to subtract these two numbers, z1 minus z2, then we're just going to subtract the real and the imaginary parts rather than adding. So we would do negative 3 minus 4 to get negative 7. And then we would do 5 minus a negative 1 to be a positive 6. And that's all there is to addition and subtraction for the polar form. No one does addition and subtraction using the polar form of a complex number. So if you do have complex numbers in their polar form and you want to add or subtract them, you're just going to convert back to your rectangular form first in order to add them. I don't think this is too important, so to save on time, I'm not going to work any examples on this. And we're going to start with the rectangular form first, and then we'll also talk about the polar form as well. So multiplication is pretty simple. You can just distribute or FOIL the way that you normally would. And then you just need to keep in mind that j squared is equal to negative 1. So as an example, if we have z1 is 2, well, j times 2, and then let's say z2 is negative 5 plus j times 3, then to do z1 times z2, we're just going to distribute the j and the 2 into each term in the parentheses. So if we do that, j2 and then times negative 5. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. So we're just going to get negative 10 times j from that. And then when we have j2 times j3, we can multiply 2 and 3 to get 6. And then we also multiply j times j is j squared. And remember that j squared is actually negative 1. So this is actually 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. And then we have minus 10j, or j, or j times 10. And then that would be the result of z1 times z2. I guess I'll make a quick comment. So you may have noticed that I always write j first, and then whatever uh, real number that's multiplying second. You don't have to write it that way. A lot of people will actually write it as, for instance, here 5j rather than j times 5. Uh, but I have been trying to 
And I myself usually write it this way as well, to be honest. But from what I can tell in your class, you tend to write it more in this way. So I have been trying to be consistent with the notation in your class. Let's do just one more simple example. So this time, let's say z1 is 1 minus j times 2. And z2 is 2 plus j times 3. So this time, to multiply z1 and z2, it's a little bit more complicated. So in this situation, we're going to FOIL out what we have here. So we can do 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times j times 3. It's just j times 3. Then we have minus j times 2 times 2. It's going to be minus 4, well, j times 4. And then finally, minus j2 times j3. 2 and 3 gives us 6, and j times j gives us j squared. So we have minus 6 and j squared. Again, j squared is negative 1. So this is going to turn into plus 6 altogether. And then we can add the real parts. So 2 plus 6 will give us 8. And then we can add the imaginary parts. So 3j minus 4j will give us negative 1j. So that's how complex multiplication works in the rectangular form. So division is a little bit trickier to do in the rectangular form. Uh, I want to take a look at a simple example first. So let's say we have z1 is negative 3 plus j2. And then let's say we have z2, which is j4. And we want to do z1 divided by z2. So we have negative 3 plus j times 2 over j times 4. So there's a trick that we can use to simplify this, which is we're going to multiply numerator and denominator by j. So first, since I'm multiplying both the numerator and the denominator by the same thing, I'm really just multiplying by 1, if you will. So I'm not changing the value of the expression by doing this. But when I do this, what happens in the denominator is we're going to get 4 times j squared. And we know j squared is negative 1. So in the denominator, we're going to be left with negative 4. Whereas in the numerator, we can distribute the j, and we'll get negative 3j uh, plus 2 times j squared, which is going to be minus 2. What we have now is in the denominator, notice that there's no j anymore in the denominator. So we exploited the fact that j squared is negative 1 to get rid of the j that was in the denominator. And then we can further simplify this a little bit more now. So we can divide negative 4 into each of the terms in the numerator. So that will give us j times 3 over negative 4. And then we also have minus 2 over negative 4. And simplifying a little bit more, the minuses will cancel. This is going to leave us with j times 3 fourths. This will leave us with plus 2 over 4, which is plus 1 half. And then this will be the result of z1 divided by z2. Now for something more complicated, so for instance, if we have something like, let's keep negative 3 plus j times 2 in the numerator. But if the denominator is not simply a multiple of j, let's say the denominator looks more like 1 plus j times 2. Here, it's a little bit less clear, perhaps, how to handle this situation. What we want to do is we want to try doing the same trick that we did up here, where we multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing. And the thing that we multiply by, we want that to get rid of the j in the denominator. Because once we're left with a real number in the denominator, we can then split the fraction into a real and an imaginary part, as we did here. So the goal is to figure out what should we multiply by to the numerator and the denominator to get rid of the j in the denominator. So what we need to multiply by is called the complex conjugate. I'm going to introduce what complex conjugates are first. So if we have a complex number z, 
in the rectangular form, x plus jy. It's complex conjugate. We denote that by z star. And the complex conjugate of z is going to be x minus j times y. So basically, you are just changing the sign in the middle from plus to minus. Or similarly, if you had minus in the middle for the complex conjugate, it would change to a plus. Uh, an example to make sure that we all understand this. If you have z is 2 minus j3, then z star, the complex conjugate of z, would be 2 plus j times 3. If z is actually a real number, like say if z were equal to 4, think of that as 4 plus j times 0. So the complex conjugate would be 4 minus j times 0, which we'll see is still 4. So more generally, the complex conjugate of a real number will just be itself. And likewise, if you have a purely imaginary number, so say if z is j times 5, you can think of that as 0 plus j times 5. So the complex conjugate of that should be 0 minus j times 5. So it would be minus j times 5. Now, for us, what complex conjugates are useful for? Now, for us, what the complex conjugate is useful for is if we multiply z times its complex conjugate, if we FOIL this out, we're going to get x squared minus jxy plus jyx minus j squared y squared. Now, these middle two terms are going to cancel out. And then over here, j squared is negative 1. So this will actually become plus y squared. So we see that when we multiply a complex number with its complex conjugate, the result that we get is x squared plus y squared. And you'll notice that that is a purely real number because there are no j's in that expression. This will help us in doing complex division. So to see how that will work is, let's take the example that we have negative 3 plus j times 2 over 1 plus j times 2. What we're going to do is multiply numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. By doing this in the denominator here, when we multiply these together, we're going to end up with a real number. Specifically, we're going to end up with x squared plus y squared. x was 1 and y was 2. In the numerator, we would have to FOIL this stuff out. So we'd have to do negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. Negative 3 times negative j2, that will give us positive 6j. We'll get plus 2j. And then here we'll get minus 4j squared. So that leaves us with 5 in the denominator. In the numerator, 6j plus 2j is 8j, which I'll maybe switch back to writing as j times 8. And then j squared is negative 1, so minus 4j squared is actually plus 4. And then negative 3 plus 4 gives us 1. So in general, for complex division, when you're in the rectangular form, the trick is to multiply numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Next, we'll talk about how to do multiplication and division using the polar form for a complex number. So let's say we have two complex numbers, z1, which is r1, e to the j, data 1. And then z2 is r2 times e to the j, data 2. Some of the properties of exponents that you should be familiar with uh, continue to hold when we're multiplying complex exponentials, like the two that we have here. So just in case you guys need a reminder, some properties of exponents. If you have u to the m 
times u to the n. You can combine these two by adding the exponents. And if you are dividing two powers like this, you can combine them by subtracting the exponents instead. I'll also remind everyone that when you have a negative exponent, that moves it down into the denominator. So u to the negative n becomes 1 over u to the n. So when we multiply z1 and z2, all we're going to do is multiply the coefficients. And then we're going to multiply the two complex exponentials. And when we multiply them, we can use this property here and combine them into a single complex exponential by simply adding the exponents together. So if we simplify this a little bit in the exponent, we can factor the j out from both terms. And then this will give us the product of z1 and z2 in polar form. Division is similar. So if we're doing z1 over z2, so we'd have z1 over z2. Uh, similarly, we can just divide the coefficients, r1 over r2. And then we can divide the complex exponentials. And to do that, we'll use this property here. Since we're dividing, we can combine them into a single exponential by subtracting the exponents. And I've already gone ahead and factored the j out from both terms. So then this tells us how multiplication and division work in the polar form. And then as you can see, it is simpler than the rectangular form. So whereas for addition and subtraction, it's more convenient to use the rectangular form for complex numbers. For multiplication and division, it is more convenient to use the polar form instead. And let's just take a look at a couple of examples. Let's say if z1 is 3 e to the j times power over 3. And let's say z2 is 5 e to the j power over 4. Then we can multiply z1 times z2. And we will get 3 times 5 is 15 times e to the j. And then if we just add the two angles, pi over 3 plus pi over 4, then that would give us the product of z1 and z2. If we want to simplify, pi over 3 plus pi over 4, if you get a common denominator, that should be 7 pi over 12. And then an example, if we were dividing two complex numbers, if z1 is 12 e to the j 2 pi over 3, and z2 is 4 e to the j 7 pi over 6, and we want to calculate z1 divided by z2. So we would do 12 over 4 is 3 e to the j, and then we're going to have the difference in the two angles, so 2 pi over 3 minus 7 pi over 6. And if we get a common denominator to simplify the exponent, looks like we'll get uh, 2 pi over 3 is 4 pi over 6 minus 7 pi over 6 will give us negative 3 pi over 6 or negative pi over 2. Earlier, I mentioned that there is another notation for complex numbers when you're writing them in polar coordinates. So here I've been using the complex exponential form, but I mentioned how sometimes you'll see people write a complex number just in terms of r and the angle theta. So if I use this notation, then when you multiply z1 and z2. Here, when we did it using the complex exponential form, we saw how it worked was you just multiply r1 and r2. 
And then when you multiply the complex exponentials together, using properties of exponents, you end up adding the angles theta 1 and theta 2. And likewise, we saw that when you divide the two complex numbers, you divide r1 over r2. And then again, using properties of exponents, when you divide the complex exponentials, that amounts to subtracting theta 1 minus theta 2. So this is what complex multiplication and division will look like using this alternate notation for the polar form of a complex number. So here in this example, you could write z1 times z2 is 15 for r. The angle ended up being 7 pi over 12. And likewise over here, when we did z1 over z2 in this example, we had r was 3, and we had an angle of negative pi over 2. So I wanted to just make sure that you guys were familiar with this notation as well. I believe that in your class E1202, that you guys will be using this notation over the complex exponential notation. I wanted to do this using the complex exponential notation, though, because I think using the complex exponential, that's where it makes sense that you would add the exponents together. When you're multiplying and subtract the exponents when you divide, we can see that that comes naturally from properties of exponents. Whereas if I just introduced these rules here without the complex exponential, it would maybe not make much sense why we were adding and subtracting the angles. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the interpretation of complex multiplication and complex division. Let's say that we have a complex number z as a point in the plane. R represents distance to the origin. Theta is the angle that it makes with the positive x-axis. And then we could express this, this complex number z as R and theta. So I'm going to go ahead and use this notation now. And then let's say we had another complex number, which I'm going to call W. So W will have, in polar coordinates, let's say W is R1, angle theta 1. So we talked about how multiplying w times z in polar form, that product will be r1 times r. And then for the angle with multiplication, the angles add together, so theta plus theta 1. So what this means is when we multiply by w, so in the picture, what this means is first adding theta 1 to theta. That means that we're kind of rotating the picture by adding some additional angle to it. So let's say if this angle was theta 1, what we've done is we've rotated z to now lie somewhere along this angle. And then furthermore, since we multiplied by r1, that affects the distance to the origin. Let's say that this point here, if this was w times z, then this distance from that point to the origin would, would be r1 times r. So when we multiplied by w, we did two things. We kind of scaled the picture by a factor of r1, and then we also rotated by the angle of theta1. So when you multiply by a complex number, you are scaling and rotating. That's what's going on. The same is true of division as well. Division is also scaling and rotating. The only difference is, so for z divided by w, we would have r divided by r1. And as for the angle, for complex division, the angles get subtracted. So we'll have data minus data 1. So you could say that z has been scaled by a factor of 1 over r1 since we multiplied the original r by 1 over r1 and we are rotating by an angle of minus theta 1 this time since we are subtracting an angle of theta 1 from the original angle data remember that rotating by a positive angle that's a counterclockwise rotation whereas rotating by a negative angle means it's a clockwise rotation as a special case of what we just talked about Let's consider the imaginary number j, which remember that j, you can think about as 0 plus j times 1. 
So as a point in the plane, it would be located at the point 0, 1. Its distance to the origin would be 1. So r would be 1. It's on the positive y-axis, so the angle data would be pi over 2. So in polar form, j would be 1 with an angle of 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. Maybe I'll go ahead and use degrees this time. And then let's say we have another complex number, z, which in polar form is r and in an angle data. When we multiply by j, we would multiply 1 times r. So we just get r again. For the angle, we would add 90 degrees to data. Likewise, if we were to divide by j instead, we would have r divided by 1, which is still r. As for the angle, we would do data minus 90 degrees. One place where this comes up in EE1202 is looking at the voltage and impedance of capacitors and inductors in an AC circuit. So very briefly, we have these formulas that the voltage of a capacitor is equal to the current through the capacitor times the impedance of the capacitor. And the formula for the impedance of a capacitor, it's 1 over j times omega, which represents the angular frequency of the alternating voltage force, and then times the capacitance of the capacitor C. And likewise for an inductor, people use L for inductors. The voltage of an inductor is equal to the current through it times the impedance of the inductor. And then the formula for the impedance of an inductor is J times again omega, which represents angular frequency, and then times the inductance of the inductor L. So looking at the formulas for the voltage of a capacitor and an inductor, notice that here we are multiplying by J. As we saw earlier, multiplying by J is going to add 90 degrees to the overall angle. So that means the overall angle for the voltage of the inductor is going to be 90 degrees more than the angle for the current. So that means that the voltage of the inductor, it leads the current by 90 degrees. On the other hand, over here, for the voltage of the capacitor, in the formula, we are dividing by J. And we know that when we divide by J, that leads to subtracting 90 degrees from the initial angle. So this means that the angle for the voltage of the capacitor is going to be 90 degrees behind the angle for the current, since we were dividing the current by J. Since the voltage is 90 degrees behind the current, we can say that the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees for capacitors. So this is just a small example of where some of the stuff that we're talking about will come up in your class. Next, I'm going to talk about complex conjugates again, but now using the polar form of complex numbers. So remember that if z is x plus j y, the complex conjugate z star is x minus j y. Here I'm going to draw a picture. Let's say that this point here is the complex number z. So this would be x on the real axis, and this would be j, y on the imaginary axis. z star, the complex conjugate, would be located down at this point. So this is z star, because it's x, and then minus j, y for z star. So what we see is that compass conjugate, what it does is it basically reflects across the real axis. So the distance between z and the origin 
is going to be the same as the distance between Z star and the origin as well, since that distance doesn't change under reflections. And then whatever angle theta this is, this angle is also going to be theta. In this picture, Z in polar form would be R e to the j theta, or simply R angle theta. As for the complex conjugate Z star, it's going to be R, but it makes an angle of theta with the positive x-axis, but this is going to be measured clockwise from the x-axis to get to Z star. So remember that when you're measuring an angle clockwise from the x-axis, you have to put a minus sign in front of it. So that means that Z star is actually going to be R e to the j times negative theta. So for complex conjugates in the polar form, R remains the same, but theta gets negated. So for example, if Z is the complex number 3 e to the 5 pi over 4 times j, then Z star, the complex conjugate, be 3 e to the negative j 5 pi over 4. And then lastly, I also want to talk about calculating the square root of a complex number. So for calculating square roots of a complex number, you really need to be using the polar form. There is really no easy way to calculate a square root using the rectangular form. And the idea is pretty simple. Recall that when you're square rooting a real number, that's the same as raising it to a power of 1 half. And the same is true for complex numbers as well. And then another property of exponents that I want to remind you guys of is when you have something raised to a power, and then all of that being raised to another power, you can rewrite that by simply combining the exponents into one by multiplying them together. And then there's one more property of exponents that I want to mention as well, which is when you have a product and you raise it to a power, you can distribute that power to each term in the product. And so using these properties of exponents, this will allow us to easily calculate square roots. So the way that works is if z is r e to the j theta, then the square root of z it would be the same as raising all of this for z to a power of 1 half. And then using this third property, you can distribute the 1 half to each term. So you'd get r to the 1 half, and then you would get e to the j theta, all to the power of 1 half. And then using this second property here, we can simply multiply this 1 half into the exponent of the e. So what that leaves us with is the square root of z is going to be r to the 1 half, which I will rewrite as the square root of r. And then multiplying the 1 half into the exponent, we're going to get e to the j times theta over 2. Now technically for complex numbers, uh, there are two square roots. So just like how any positive real number, there are technically two square roots, plus or minus. Same thing with complex numbers. So technically for square root of z, it should be plus or minus the square root of r, and then e to the j data over 2. For a quick example of this, let's say that z is 16 e to the j pi over 3. Then the square root of z would be plus or minus the square root of 16 times e to the j. And then I want to multiply pi over 3 by 1 half. And that will give me pi over 6. And then if we want, we can simplify this a little bit. Namely, the square root of 16 is 4. So the square root of z is going to be plus or minus 4 times e to the j pi over 6. Using the alternate notation without the complex exponential, if z is r angle theta, 
then what we're saying is that the square root of z would be the square root of r with an angle of theta over 2. And technically, it could be plus or minus this. So this is the same thing as what we just talked about, just using the alternate notation without the complex exponential. So you just square root r and then divide the angle by 2. And that's how you get the square root of a complex number. That's it for this video.